This is a screenshot of the block of Chapter 10 on the Course Connect page. And in addition to the Chapter 10 video, which you see here at the top, there are a number of, um, of resources I've put on here for the uh, project for the last chapter. Uh, we're not doing a quiz for this chapter. We're having instead something that I call the Grammar and Style um, Analysis Project. So that's what the GSA stands for. Okay, so the instructions are there, and I'm going to look at them in, in a minute with you. Uh, but also I have um, a number of other um, uh, documents there. Um, let's, well, actually, let's look at the instructions first, um, and so we can explain the, the goal of the project. So here are your uh, instructions, or the first couple paragraphs of it, and um, the you read through the instructions carefully, and I, I've tried to, I know that I'm asking to do uh, several things in this project, but I've tried to make the instructions pretty um, um, detailed, uh, but do, don't hesitate to call me or email me if you have questions about it. So the goal of this project is to apply what students have been learning about language to real-world writing, that of professional writers, but also of their own work. They will do this by an analysis of both kinds of writing that demonstrates effective knowledge of grammar and style. All right, so it, it consists of two parts, a marked up copy of a short piece of professional prose that shows your awareness of uh, the grammatical structures and stylistic choices employed by the author with uh, maybe just a couple of comments on what the author's writing strategy might have been. And then select a sample of your own writing, ideally something that might already be a work in progress for another course that you also uh, mark up uh, to reflect your um, grammatical and stylistic analysis of your writing. So if you, if you are a creative writer, you might take something that you've been working on for either for yourself or, or for a course, um, or you might just take a, a paper that you, that you did in the last semester, anything you want that's your own work. And then the, finally, the last thing you're going to do with that is to revise it to hopefully improve the style. So after you, if you've been reading Chapter 10, uh, you've um, been seeing how uh, authors make choices. They have strategies for trying to have a certain effect on their writing. So that's really what I'm trying to get you to do for this project. So going back to the Course Connect page, um, here are the instructions that I just was just mentioning to you. And then um, uh, there is a, a copy of the professional writing sample. If you follow this link here, um, it's just a, it's a, it's a, a piece of writing, a beginning of a piece of writing by um, a very famous nonfiction writer, Annie Dillard. And then f to kind of demonstrate what um, I'm asking you to do, I've included another uh, passage. It's actually a passage from The Wizard of Oz, the, the actual book by Frank Baum. And then uh, a passage there, and then uh, a, an example of my marking up that, that document in a way that you can do. You don't have to do it exactly the way I do it, and we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, and then um, I, I am providing an, a sample of my own writing, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Uh, and then so what, how I've marked up my writing and come to some conclusions about it, and then I revised that work, uh, that, that, that bit of work, um, um, to do that for you. So um, one thing, it's in the instructions, I'll just mention it here too, that uh, you're only really dealing with short passages here. If you choose something that's about 300 words of your own writing, that, that's plenty. All right, here is the sample of professional writing that I've chosen for this, or at least the, the beginning of it, just to show you um, what it looks like. And uh, as I mentioned, you, you don't, in the, in the instructions, you don't have to analyze every stinking uh, thing in every little sentence that is in the, the sample, but it, you should be doing enough to, sh to demonstrate that you know what's going on in the sentence. Um, and in this particular sample, uh, just to give you an example, um, you, you might look particularly for things like non, um, 
non-restrictive modifiers in a sentence. Uh, look for commas that might set those things off. Um, if there are restrictive relative clauses or um, participial phrases or those things, those can be helpful uh, too. So uh, just, uh, just to give you a little bit of a head start, you see this beginning of the sentence when I was six or seven years old? Hopefully you'll uh, recognize that that is, a, um, is an adverb clause. It's introduced by one of those um, words, uh, and then, then uh, you have um, in the rest of the clause following that. Okay, so if you see a preponderance or a tendency toward using those kind of non-restrictive modifiers or restrictive modifiers, um, what does that tell you about the writing? Uh, is it being descriptive? Is it increasing the pace? Um, anything that uh, you can say about it, and, and again, it doesn't have to be a whole lot. So once again, uh, I'm providing this additional sample just as a way of demonstrating for you uh, the kind of analysis I'm wanting you to do. Okay, so here's uh, the beginning of a chapter of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, and we hear, uh, hear about um, Dorothy. Okay, so in looking over this, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly short uh, little piece here, but uh, this is something that uh, a book that is meant for a young audience, and I think that the analysis that I'll show you will demonstrate maybe how it achieves that. All right, my uh, sample here, um, I've, I've chosen to um, color code it, um, color code some of the things I'm noticing just so you can see it. You don't really have to go to that uh, much trouble if you uh, were. Um, yeah, you um, want to just underline it and, and label the thing that you're seeing there, that's fine. You don't have to have it in color. But uh, when you, if you, if you look at it with me here, uh, I've highlighted, okay, when Dorothy was left alone, she began to feel hungry. So there's an adverb clause that begins that sentence. Um, um, you, we have other non-restrictive modifiers down here. We have a couple of restrictive um, participial phrases, um, and so if you go through the rest of that passage uh, and, and marking the things that you're seeing, then at the end you can kind of come to some conclusions about well, what kind of an effect does he, is the author uh, uh, achieving, and how does he or she does do, how does she or he do that? And I'll then I'll skip now to show you some of my comments or observations about this. Now it says in my analysis essay. Uh, this is um, from a file uh, that I've used when I teach this. When I teach this course in the classroom, I actually have students write an essay for this project. We have a lot more time to spend on this uh, project, and so they mark up a piece of paper with the the passage, and then they they write a short essay. I'm just asking you to provide some comments on uh, what you see, and so this is you can just it could be just like a bullet list. All right, so about the Dorothy passage that, uh, that we're just looking at, um, I notice the use of non-restricted modifiers, but not excessively. Um, you, if, if you looked at those um, um, phrases and clauses that I highlighted, um, there weren't all that many, and I think there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, the largest number of non-restricted modifiers are present participial phrases which makes sense in that they show attendant circumstance. Remember that important um, term that we were talking about in some of our chapters. Um, as this is going on, this other thing is going on too, that the sense of two things happening at the same time. It's a common descriptive device, and so it's perfectly appropriate for a, a work of fiction like this. However, I also noticed that there are many compounded phrases and clauses. In chapter 10, we read about how it is common for younger writers to do this, and the author may be trying to inject a kind of youthful voice to represent Dorothy's consciousness. And this is the reason why I think that, there, that not using that many non-restrictive modifiers is, is, is uh, going on here, because that would make it sound too sophisticated. And then finally, the strategy is further supported by the passage's diction. Fairly simple language that typical uh, children would use, and the use of such informal multi-word verb constructions like, quote, to help her out, to, to help out her breakfast, and uh, she said about making ready. So informal, uh, 
oh, oh, very childlike types of word choices. The next link takes you to a sample of my own writing that I actually did an analysis of. This is not all of it, but just a part of it. Um, and I guess maybe I should need to explain a little bit about the topic of this. Um, this, the, this sample of writing is, is taken from a memoir that I have been working on. Uh, when I was um, 19 through 22 years old, I actually was a Franciscan friar, and, um, uh, I, I, and about five or six years ago, I, start, I started on, on this project, uh, this memoir project, um, uh, during my, a sabbatical that I had as a professor here. And so this, the project is to write about those three and a half years that I was a friar and, you know, the initial um, enthusiasm and all that stuff and then eventually becoming disillusioned with it. So just to give you that as a little bit of background, I tried to also make it, um, some parts of it funny because uh, there are a lot of really crazy things that happened to me during that time. All right, so just to, to show you some of the things I've, I've done here, in this section here, I you know, noticed that I hadn't been consciously thinking about how I did this, but I had um, um, strung along these several, um, uh, actually there would be gerund phrases. Uh, one of the tricks I remembered involved this and this and this. So this pronoun taking the place of, of um, the, um, the gerund kind of showed me that it's, it's fun they're functioning as as nouns. Um, so stringing them together, it was uh, certainly a way of trying to create a certain pace. Um, and then, uh, oh, in this next one, um, I had another string. And then what I was deciding that I wanted to do is we have another similar string here, running a speaker wire out of his window where he planted a speaker under his bed and playing spooky voices recorded on a cassette. Um, I notice here that um, instead of having a um, parallel structure with uh, four straight um, gerund phrases, um, I interrupted that this phrase, the phrase is running and playing with uh, a verb that says planted. And I thought for my revision, that's something I, I'm going to consider uh, doing and actually I will do for the revision. So. Um, and not to belabor this, but again, I'm looking at my, my own writing, noticing what I've done, because I haven't ne necessarily been very conscious about what I'm doing, I'm just trying to write. But the knowledge of what I, I, I do in the analysis can help me to improve the writing um, by making some conscious decisions for, um, for uh, revision. And finally, uh, this is just a small section of the revision that I actually did. And one of the things you can see is that I did go ahead and change this series, the second series, um, running a speaker wire out of his window and into AJ's room, plugging it into a speaker planted under his bed, and playing sp spooky voices recorded on a cassette. So that may be a little change, but it, it um, I guess it, it shows a, a bit of a smoother sentence. It doesn't. It's not interrupted by different kinds of verb forms. Um, so that's just like one example of some of the things that, that I would be looking for uh, when you do your own uh, sample and the revision of that sample. So if you have questions about what you're expected to do in this, please let me know. And uh, otherwise, um, good luck with that and you know, choose something fun that you might like to revise a little bit.